Well, uh, yes, I come from Finland, working now for UCL, School of Energy and Resources, which is located just over there on Victoria Square in the old Torrens building. I came here about eight months ago, moved to West Beach four months ago. Seems to be a nice place. And because of this recent move to Australia, I thought I would approach the question from an international angle to explain what the features of the Australian nuclear policy or lack of it stroke me the most when I moved here a little while ago. Now, first from an international perspective, people are talking about the revival of nuclear. And if you look at the projections on the screen, the International Energy Agency in uh, this screen seem to project that there will be an increase of nuclear-based generation. Currently, the, we have projects, not that many, but to me, the revival of nuclear doesn't mean that we should have or we would have at the moment large amount of investment. It means an ideological revival. Countries are looking back at the decisions. Countries like Sweden or Germany made the decision to phase down their nuclear fleet to a certain, in a certain timetable. They now revisited those decisions in Sweden. They reinterpreted their decision and said, well, they are not actually going to turn off, but they will not add anything. So instead of phasing off the nuclear power generation, they prolonged the life cycle or the lifetime. In Germany, they did the same more transparently, said that, okay, look, situation has changed. We need to revisit our decisions and change them. Why? Well, the primary push is obviously the need to reduce emissions and nuclear being virtually emission free on the generation side is a wonderful way of doing that. High and volatile energy prices help that certainly and the growing concerns of energy security issues in Europe means we don't want to be reliant on Russian gas. In US, it means something else. But a growing concern about energy security. Those things drive then the nuclear revival at an ideological level. Now, Australia uh, is very different. And I was frankly very surprised when I came here because, well, even if we had 69, a attempt to go for nuclear, which failed. And apparently today there's a large oversized parking lot that serves the local surfing community. And that's what's left of that attempt. But today, the nuclear debate, so to say, in Australia is marked by the absence of it. It seems that the approach in Australia is almost religion type approach where you don't talk about it. There are people who are very strongly pro-nuclear, very small and very vocal group. There's another group, the larger group, which are very much against the whole idea. And it appears to me that those against nuclear, and I'm coming from Finland, which has a large nuclear capacity, is just constructing another power plant based on nuclear and licensed two more just some months ago. For us, nuclear is a way to generate power. It doesn't raise these sensitive issues that seems to be the case over here. And my suspicion is that like in many other public discussions and political discussions, the naysayers are against it for all the wrong reasons and not actually knowing the facts because of lack of discussion. And these type of the pictures I put in, these type of questions, Chernobyl, uh, terrorism, even nuclear weapons, like Gus said, are factors that drive these concerns. 
So my first point, I have only a couple of points. The first point is that Australia is lacking a balanced and objective discussion on this topic. I think these type of events are perfect to start something because there might be a day where we do need to consider that option and without a public debate, it's going to be very difficult. Second, well, second issue that I wanna discuss are just other points that seem to be of a concern to me in Australia. First, something I know very little about because I'm a lawyer, I'm not an economist, but over here, those who oppose, those who are more educated and actually understand economics far more than I do, seem to argue that nuclear, well, even with a price on carbon, won't be economically viable. And the argument basically goes that because if you look at a nuclear project, it's heavily front-end investment. You invest, well, in the Finnish example, the original price was 3 billion euros, which is roughly, let's say, 4 million U uh, Australian dollars. Well, it's doubled now. It's not 3, but it's 6 billion. But in that case, the money has to come from somewhere at the very initial stages. So the critical issue is, what is the interest rate? If the interest rates are above 10, 15, it's not viable. If they are five, yes, it's viable. And the economists seem to say that in a commercial world, 5% is not an option, that it's more like 10, 15, and therefore it's not viable. But again, if we look at the Finnish example, the bulk of the investment came from uh, Bavarian or something very close to, to that, Bavarian uh, National Bank at their interest rate of 2.6%. And that's a commercial loan in the sense that the operators of the plant are commercial. Uh, I don't know the reason why they managed to get such a low interest rate, but they did. Uh, my own suspicion is it has probably something to do with Siemens being part of the consortia with Areva, who are providing for the power plant. And it's a first of a kind, a generation three plus, and so they wanted to make sure it happens. But in addition to that point that economics can be influenced by different things, it's also in the end a political decision in Australia. It's not going to be a commercial decision. If you look at the sensitivity of the issue at the moment, it's quite clear that the decision is a political one. And in the event that, let's say, the federal government starts to back nuclear, there are ways that they can facilitate the investment. Loan guarantees, like in the US, uh, being just one tiny example. There are many other ways to do that, much like governments all over the world are doing with green or wind energy at the moment, massive subsidies. But it's going to be a political decision, not a commercial one. The other striking feature is the absence of a regulatory framework. To my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, at the moment, it's legally not possible to build up a power plant based on nuclear generation. Uh, it would be actually illegal. And if one day, we need to do something about it. We have to start from scratch. There is nothing. There is not a licensing procedure. There's no operating regulations, no decommissioning. There's nothing there. So everything has to be done from scratch, which to me, again, sounds strange. I can understand that at the moment, if the government would come out and say that we are building up, we are setting up now the regulatory framework for nuclear, people would take that to mean that, okay, we are going to nuclear, and for that reason, that would be difficult. But the first step, or one of the first steps, to prepare for the future, just for the event, if it's a regulatory framework that covers all areas of nuclear power generation. 
Second, equally important thing is education. If there are no expertise in Australia on nuclear, it's going to be very difficult to construct anything, or there's a need to import all the know-how, which again, is probably not something we want to see. So those, those issues, the regulatory framework and the setting up of an educational program to build up the expertise for the event that we want to change our minds are the key issues in my opinion. And that's basically also my conclusion. It's another thing to say that we don't want nuclear at the moment. We don't see that as an option for Australia for a number of reasons. But it's a very different thing to sort of put your head in the bush and not prepare for the possibility of needing it. I don't want to go into much detail, but as a lawyer I can't resist to say that the regulatory, regulation side, because this is a very sensitive issue here, a very political issue, for licensing of these plants, if Australia goes for some sort of regulation, the licensing scheme should in my opinion, take into consideration both the political level and the more technical administrative level, which would in practice mean a, at least two level decision making, a decision in principle type of decision at a political level, and followed then by a technical decision where the merits of each project are then assessed. This is obviously coming from Finnish model, but I think in a way, it fits well the Australian situation. Second thing that the scheme would have to have is the participation of both federal, state, and even local level because of this, these fears, which in my opinion are overestimated and are exaggerated. But because of these issues, the scheme would have to involve as many stakeholders as possible. That's basically what I wanted to say. So some discussion is necessary. This cannot be a religious issue. It's a real issue. And even if we don't go for it, we need to prepare for it just for the event that if one day we want to, we have to do that. And that requires regulation. That requires education. I'm sure it requires a lot of other stuff, but this is my expertise, so I won't go into that. Maybe you can tell us what else it requires. Thank you. Well, I guess perhaps in our society, we tend to think of the timescales for new technology more or less along the lines of PCs, where every few years you buy a new one and throw the old one out. But in uh, power generation, you've got extraordinarily large investments and the, the infrastructure is very expensive and takes a very long time to get these things going. To build power stations takes well in excess of 10 years. They typically operate for more than 30 years. And hence, as we know, the challenge of meeting it is very, um, if we're going to meet our deadline of reducing CO2 by 60%, then we need to really begin preparing. And I think that's a question I'd like perhaps the two of you to comment on a bit more. Perhaps Barry, you might like to pick up on that. Yeah, I'll certainly develop that, um, that idea in my talk. It'll come up soon. Um, getting to Tim's um, points on, um, on how do you finance these plants and how do you set up a regulatory structure, I think they're really important points that he's raised. Uh, I guess a question that, that arises obviously from that is nuclear is a highly capital intensive operation but it generates enormous amounts of energy. Another one that comes to mind which has relatively low running costs but high capital is renewables. So can you see the same sort of financing problem hitting large renewable energy projects as would hit nuclear? Both of those, if you work out the levelised cost of electricity, it's all front ended in that capital and finance. Um, whereas something like gas, for instance, it's fairly cheap to build up front, but 
potentially high and rising fuel costs. How does a society legally um, set up a framework to prepare for that? Or, because in this, otherwise it's all short-termism and we will build gas and we won't build renewables or nuclear because of that high capital cost. Yeah. I guess for uh, renewables, the amount are much smaller. You don't need six billion per investor or per project. So that's obviously a difference. The amounts are smaller because the power delivered is smaller. Exactly. O obviously, yes. the amounts on a per power Precisely. basis. Precisely. Um, so, so that's an interesting point because something which hasn't t had much uptake in the nuclear field so far, and I won't talk a lot about it, but I'll raise it here, is the concept of small modular reactors rather than monolithic 1.6 gigawatt power stations. So you know, if you've got a reactor that's 10 or 100 megawatts in size and it costs you know, 100 million to build rather than a 1.6 gigawatt reactor yeah. that costs Four billion to build. You know, that's you can start to see the appeal for that, even if the cost per kilowatt is actually more expensive than the monolithic. Yeah. Yeah. But with renewables, from a investor perspective, it's it's more dispersed. There are a lot of investors going into this area. Mm -hmm. Well, and because of the government subsidies, it's a very appealing area where you have a guaranteed return for 20 years. See, there's a rush to this market. And because of that more dispersed investor profile, you don't have one or two, but you have actually a lot of them. I would say that's a, yeah, the, the difference is quite big in, in that sense. So if we look to the real world, we have two types of proposals. We have plants being built in China that are backed by the government. Okay? So they're the risk backer and they're the financier. Yeah. So places place like China and India are the obvious examples, South Korea. Then you have the debate in the US, which is about how you get financing for these plants, and you have the loan guarantees, yeah. which are essentially designed, as far as I understand it, to chop off that risk margin that's put on the interest rate for the larger plants. Exactly. Um, is that something that, say, Finland but is exploring? Then you have, you have in Finland the example where it's actually industry, energy-intensive industry, that came together and made the investment together. And these guys, do not want, these companies don't want uh, a monetary return from their investments. They take the electricity that comes from the plant in principle forever. Mm -hmm. As long as the plant is in operation, obviously the shareholders might change, but that's for their own purposes. This is actually an old structure that we've had for a very long time, which is a kind of a cartel, but it has the positive side that it brings investments and therefore it's allowed and at the very beginning it was mostly the energy intensive industry paper and pulp uh, metals that needed the energy and they thought that it's better to have it yourself than to rely on others uh, today that group of company has grown to smaller power producers so communal power producers come together with these guys and use that nuclear-based generation as a part of their portfolio. But in that scenario, there are no government subsidies on that mm. investment. But it's actually made by private companies in Finland. And even the two new licenses are now granted to E.ON from Germany together with a large group of Finnish companies, and they come together and build and have their own electricity instead of relying on a power, well, the Nordic grid to, to get their supply. Perhaps one other question that the uh, audience might be interested in, you talked about the political drivers and the need for the political debate in Australia. Perhaps you can comment a bit more about what the political drivers were for choosing nuclear in Finland. Well, originally it had a lot to do with being next to Russia and wanting to have independence from Russia. Today, it's not really a political issue. It's another way of producing electricity. So the new, well, I do have to say that in the political, we have that decision in principle made at the political level one 
of the factors that the Minister of uh, Trade and Industry, which includes energy, noted was that it creates energy independence. And for us, it largely means independence from Russia. Mm. And because of uh, recent history from the 40s, there is still a, uh, let's say, a tension. Ten <laughs> not tension really, but a widely perceived need to be independent from Russia. So, yes, there is a still that independence issue, that, but it's lot much less politicized than in many other places. The other good point you raised was about the lack of regulatory framework and how long it would take to, to get nuclear here if we made that decision because we're not moving the debate forward. And I think that's an excellent point. Uh, if you look to what's happening in the real world, there are examples of other countries which are taking on nuclear for the first time and tackling exactly these problems. And one example is the Gulf states right now. Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, all announced that they're going towards nuclear and working on how to do this. And they seem to be taking an approach of piggybacking almost onto the, onto the, the framework that exists elsewhere. So UAE is looking to get the South Koreans to come in and do the training. And so they've got a $20 billion contract to build four reactors and another $20 billion contract to keep the South Koreans there for 25 years, running the plants, training the local staff, developing the whole infrastructure. And then for the reactor types as well, for others, they've looked to the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission to, to establish oversight for licensing these reactors and say using a reactor like the AP1000, which has been certified there, so they don't need to set up their own structure. And it strikes me that uh, something similar that, that could give an example in Australia is the commercial airline industry, where we take models such as the new Airbus A380, for instance, and we don't try and license those designs here. We use the US um, regulatory structure to get those in place here. Um, they, they, they seem to me to be potential ways we could fast track that. Have you got any comments? Yeah, uh, for the first, to rely on uh, the expertise of another country is the second best option in my opinion. Secondly, depends a little bit how you define a regulatory framework, but if you implement the rules of another system, the models of another system straight into your own without very, very critical oversight and not relying on the international consultants, but actually doing it yourself. There is a risk of a clash between, well, other existing frameworks, other approaches to the same issues. So you can and you should follow model, but there's a risk that you need to be aware of. Mm. So it may shortcut the process, but it's not going to eliminate exactly. that development. Exactly, precisely. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Perhaps one other brief comment uh, before Barry comes on, but uh, you commented on the need for training, and I obviously totally agree with that, and I'm sure we all do, and it would be obvious to the audience that before we can have a, um, we, need, we need to have local capability, and that takes time to build. We know that Australia does have capability in nuclear mining. One of the challenges we would know that is, if we're going to say, for example, train nuclear power engineers, introduce a course, who is going to take the course if there's no jobs because there's no power stations there and no, no commitment from the government? So I think we need to think carefully about the path, about how we can either build on the back of the existing the mining, uh, nuclear mining, and maybe further processing of the nuclear fuel or whatever, um, and that, that path, and or we need to have government commitment to facilitate that process. And I wonder if you'd just like to comment either of you briefly on that topic before we move on to Barry's talk. Uh, well, briefly, I was at UNSW, University of New South Wales, um, a few weeks ago giving a, a, participating in a panel talk on this, and. Um, and the new chair of power systems engineering told me, and he said, quite happy for me to, to talk about this in public, is that UNSW are starting a new masters of nuclear engineering. So they're, they're re-establishing that program because they can see some, some latent interest there. And they're gonna be collaborating with AMSO, the Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organization to develop that course and get those people to, to teach into it. But it does follow on that 
why would these people be doing this? You know, um, what is their pathway? And it may be that they want to go and work internationally for a few years to get experience with other reactors. It may be that that leads into other pathways which um, which exist, say, in the mining nuclear mining industry right now. It's it's hard to say, and it is a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Um, but someone at least is starting it. UNSW is starting this process. Mm. They get Certainly, going to be need, the need for a government pathway. Yeah. yeah, at the very minimum, it it limits the number that you can actually take on these programs. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a good point, perhaps, to move on to Barry's talk.